by Mike the Big Cheese. Welcome back to the Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show. It is Sunday, September 24th, 2023, and it's the last Sunday of September. We'll never get this day back again. Uh, for me, it's a great time of year. It's the holiday season to me. We're big here on Halloween at my house. We have a massive display. We're probably like 100 animatronics. We do like this haunted carnival out in the front of our home. and It's all up now, but it's been kind of down the last couple of days because we've had some massive rain over here and heavy wind. Uh, hopefully, it'll die down by tomorrow. We'll get things up and running again. But we got a great show for everybody tonight. 
Crystal Lowe is in the house. We got almost a whole band with us tonight. Three out of the five members. Ken Mettler, Mike McDonald, and Rod Taken will be calling in first about 6.30. And then Randy Lancaster from Wrath at about 7.15. So stick around for those bands. It's going to be a great show tonight. We got a lot to talk about with Wrath also because there's so little info about them on the internet or anywhere else. So we got a lot of questions to get to with Randy tonight. Right there, TT Quick, thrown together quick, New Jersey's finest. I remember seeing T.T. Quick probably dozens of times at Lamar back in the day. They were sort of like the house band. They played all the time, and I couldn't wait for them to finally put out a record. They did a mix of covers and originals, and the originals were so good, and I couldn't wait. And I finally walked into Zigzag Records one day and saw the EP on the wall. came out on Avalanche Records in 1984. I believe Avalanche was a division of Megaforce. You know, Megaforce was the parent company of that label. I think it was probably one of the first on there. I think maybe Eric Steele. Might have came out before them, but both around the same time. And what a great band. And as you know, Mark is front and accept these days. Or watch left of accept. It's just really Wolf Hoffman in the house. Uh, but, you know, that's the way it goes with a lot of things today. All right, let's get to the music. We're trying to get out as much as we can tonight between the two interviews. How about some Hawaii? Proud to be loud.
sabotage by the grace of the witch. Chris and John Oliva are like the Lennon and McCartney of the heavy metal generation. And before that, Cruel Force. I mean, I love these. I just love this record. Uh, it's their new record, At the Dawn of the Axe. That was a song that we played. Uh, when the band came out in 2008, I, I can't remember the name of that first record. I think it was Rise of the Satanic Might. Uh, they were more like a black metal band, the death growl type vocals. The production was pretty bad. There were some pretty decent riffs in there. You just really couldn't hear them. They put out a second record. I wasn't crazy about them at the time. Uh, they were around for about three four years, disappeared. Ten years later, they got back together. Uh, this year, they put out their first record in, like I said, 10 or 11 years. And it's such a solid album. I love it from start to finish. I tried going back over the first two again to see if we might get into them. I just really couldn't. But these new re- this new record is phenomenal. They just need to kind of like, you know, they're using the stage names. Carnivore and, you know, Gigi Alex, I think, and all these other names. Just use your real names. Get rid of the makeup and just play heavy metal. They're a great thrash metal band right now. And if they keep writing like this, they're going to get even better. And then I said Sabotage by the Grace of the Witch. Uh, John Oliva had announced that he was working on a brand new Sabotage record. It would probably be the band's last and final record. Uh, you know what? Uh, he just he just got hurt, so he fell and slipped on the marble in his house. He said on wet marble, so the album's kind of get going to get delayed until the beginning of next year. I think he fell bending over to pick up a cannoli. That's just my opinion, but he broke his vertebrae, so he can't write. And he's saying he knows how important this record is and how easily he can fuck it up. Uh, the only way he could fuck up this record is by having the people involved in Sabotage that were involved in Sabotage and the later era of Sabotage. I mean, Chris is gone. We can't get him back. you got to write a new Sabotage record. Get Keith Collins back in on bass. Steve Wachholz on drums. Even Johnny Lee Milton on bass. I mean, get them back in the band. Chris Caffey was on guitar. You know, Al Petrelli was playing guitar with them for a while. Two great plays that can contribute to the band. I love Zach Stevens, everything he's done with his other bands. Uh, but I never cared for any of the stuff he did with Sabotage. To me, you know, so things started changing after Hall of the Mountain King and from Gutter Ballet on to uh, what was the last record they put out? I don't even remember. I think it was Poets of Mad Men in 2001. I didn't care for any of those records. Even though Dead Went to Dead sort of kind of gave us you know, the beginning of you know TSO, which is like a major thing today. I didn't like any of those records. You know, Even though John was involved in it, Zach just didn't fit into Sabotage, in my opinion. That's just how I feel. So write something like Sirens, The Dungeons of Call, and Power of the Night, and I'm on board. All right, how about we do our demolition segment? We get that out of the way. From there, we'll play a song by Chris alone. We'll talk to the band right after that. This is a band called Iron Cross. There were a lot of bands called Iron Cross back in the day. This is the band out of Chicago, and I had them on my show. I want to say the first year we were doing the show in 2008, I believe. We had uh, the bass player and singer on here. So this is Tooth and Nail off the band's first demo tape. <laughs>
a crystal love for you right there Fallen Angel off the finale record released by Heaven and Hell another great job by my friends over there that record label alright we'll wait a couple of minutes for uh, the guys to call in uh, about 6.30 so another minute or two uh, what else did I want to talk about before? I saw that David Lee Roth just performed live last week. Didn't he retire like two years ago? I mean, does anybody retire anymore? I mean, I retired from my job at Con Edison back in March. I don't see myself ever going back to work again. <laughs> you know, not in a real job anyway. I mean, does anybody like say they're going to retire and actually just retire? I know one person that said he did it, and that's Bob Mitchell from Attacker. Uh, we're going to have Bob on the show in about two weeks. We're going to spend the whole
whole two hours just talking to Bob, going over his career from Attacker to the Hounds of Hasselvander and everything in between if we can. And we'll play mostly his music the whole night. So I'm looking forward to that. But, you know, I, I said he was doing another live show, and he kind of lost it at me. Like, hey, you know, a lot of singers have. It's just... It's your voice. It's hard to maintain that over all these years. But when you say you're going to retire, just retire. I mean, I guess I'm not one to talk. I thought I was retiring from the show two years ago, and I came back also. It's just that I was helping to raise my two grandchildren, and it was getting to be a real handful. So uh, now that a little older, uh, and my wife is also retired, and I'm retired. It's easy. That's why we came back to do the show. But, uh, you know, that's just the way it goes. Don Dawkins says, you know, his right arm is paralyzed from his neck and spine injury. You would have thought it would have been his vocal cords considering how he's been singing over the last couple of years. Uh, absolutely horrible. I mean, I caught some of, of like a live show we did a while back. Absolutely terrible. And there's no way that he's using backing tracks like somebody said he is because he just is not singing very well. Uh, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. All right, let me see here. What do we got? 6.30. Okay, you guys should be calling in any minute now. Uh, we'll just give it another second or two. If not, I'll play another song off the record, and uh, we'll do that. And right after this, we'll be talking to Randy from Wrath. This is the Wrath from Canada. You know, there were quite a few Wraths around back in the day, uh, and this one put out just such an amazing demo tape in 1984. One of my favorites. And you know, but there's not much on the internet about these guys. You know, being a tape trader back in the 80s. When you traded a tape, you got it, you fell in love with the band, but really you didn't know anything about them either back then because there were so few magazines promoting it. I mean, Metal Forces had the demolition segment where they reviewed a lot of demo tapes. They gave bands a little heads up. Karang got a little too big and they kind of forgot about the underground bands. And that's just the way it was. All right, we got somebody right now calling in. Let's get them on the line. Ken, is that you? Hey, no, this is Rod Taken. Yeah. Hey, Rod, how are you? I wasn't sure it could be the first one to call in. Okay, uh, they said 6.30. Is that okay? Yeah, right on time. I think someone else is calling in now. Let me try to connect them. Hang on. Yes, sir. Thanks, Rod. You got it. Ken, Mike, who else is on the line with Rod? Hey, this is Kenny. Hey, hey Kenny. Up? How's it going, buddy? Hey. Good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. We got Rod on the line. I don't know if you want to wait a couple of more minutes for uh, for Mike to call in, or we could just get going, I guess, until he does. Ain't that like oh, the oh, least to be late? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that normally a drummer joke, man? Oh, oh so. no, that's about the drum stage being level, so both drool <laughs> runs out of both sides. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll be dying in any second, man. So. All right, we'll just okay. wait. We'll, we'll, so we're good. All right, we'll go. Okay, cool. So you know, I, I don't remember the last time we talked. I know it was when after Stand in the Rain came out. That had to be a couple of years back, four or five years ago. Yeah, it was. Uh, 16 and 17. Wow, I didn't even think That's it was that long. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, man. You, it's amazing how you guys are back when you're not even together. <laughs> it's just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. But this is all good you stuff. Never, yeah, man, you never say never, Mike. I'll tell you that. That's it's, true. It's yeah. crazy. Did you, did you know what, did you expect, uh, I'll throw this out of Ken first, and then we'll get to run Did you expect to put out another record with Heaven and Hell? Did you know you had this extra material that you wanted to try to get out there? Was it something that, not even an option back then when the first record came out? Yeah, you know, well, when we did this, we knew we had the three songs that were recorded in 92, but we didn't have the master tapes. So they didn't go on to the uh, Standing in the Rain record. And so... We, we ended up getting those about six months later. And then we had a, you know, a few other songs that were, some of them were complete, some of them were partials, things of that sort. So no, we didn't, we had no idea we were going to do another one until we realized that, you know, there was enough material there. It made sense. It showed some evolution of the band and Jeremy at H um, at um, heaven and hell records, uh, him and Gary were, you know, were into doing it. So it worked out great. Yeah, and it sounds phenomenal, too. And it's great to hear music that, you know, it's been around for so long, but we haven't heard. And, and Rod, when you look at the two records that have just come out, I mean, you tried so hard back in the 80s to make this happen, and it didn't. Now, 30-something years later, how does it feel to have all this music out? And, you know, a lot of people are hearing it for the first time besides the old school fans. I mean, to be quite honest, we're elated that, uh, you know, we're actually finally being celebrated. That We found a label that, you know, appreciate, appreciates us and, and, and believes in who we are and what we're about. I mean, this, this has been the dream all along was to be able to have our, our music out to the masses, you know, all over the world, you know, Japan, Germany, Greece, Italy. I mean, we're, we're getting love all over the place and we just couldn't be more <laughs> elated. We're ecstatic. We really are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, 1988, I mean, it was kind of, you know, towards the end of, you know, the whole hard rock heavy metal era, but nobody knew it at the time. Nobody saw it coming, and they, you know, we just thought the, the wave was going to keep going and going, and you guys form in Philadelphia. I mean, you're right near New Jersey, right near New York, close to all the scene that's happening. Philly had a great scene back then, so did New Jersey and New York. What was it like getting started in 1988, saying, you know, with all the bands that came before you, saying, hey, we got to come up with something that's, you know, familiar, but yet new and original? Can you want to take that one? Sure, sure. Is is Mike going with us yet? No, not yet. I didn't see him dial in. Okay, okay, okay cool. cool. Um, yeah, right. you know, like, like you said, Mike, we we were thinking that the, the wave was going to continue, right? So, um, and you know, obviously the the LA scene was huge, right, all through the eighties, and um, and in being close to New York and everything, that's where we were trying to actually do a lot of our stuff out. So, um. You know, um, you know, getting started with that, we thought that wave was going to continue, but apparently the party was going to change around '93, and we didn't know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I heard there was interest from a major label. Uh, was that right, Rod? Yeah, actually, uh, we did a show. We did several shows with major labels. Uh, we did. Um, uh, uh, Geffen, what was it? Geffen recording artist, um, uh, Salty Dog, uh, Trickster with uh, their major label debut, um, Loudness, and uh, you know they we've always gotten positive feedback uh, after the show and and uh, gotten a card from somebody saying you know call us you know uh, give us your demo give us your you know, material give us your info and 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 we'll be in touch and of course we would. It never panned out to the way we wanted it to, but I mean, but I mean, the, the the fact is, is that if we never gotten that interest, I don't believe the second album would have ever came to fruition. So we're we're again, we're we're really happy and glad that uh, Heaven and Hell uh, celebrates this style of music that uh, we're able to, you know, reach our fan base like uh, we've always wanted to do. So yeah, that's a great thing. Yeah, so you, you know, Mike, the the first. The first album, Standing in the Rain, was really three demos, right? And we did those working with um, a, a major label, Warner, out of out of New York, Warner Brothers. And we just never could work the deal. It just never happened. So we ended up doing it as an independent release. And that's what, um, that's what Jeremy at HHR ended up picking up, and that became Standing in the Rain. Well, during all the shows, as Rod was saying, you know, we, we did some shows with Trickster, and they had some which was strange because it's not even their label, but Epic A&R was there. And they came in, they said, hey, we really like the band. We got, we got the first record. We really like these songs. Can you guys go do these? So we went back in the studio and we cut um, three songs for that. And then we started trying to work the deal with them. And, and then that was right at the time when Nirvana and the Pilots and Soundgarden were yeah. hitting. Yeah. And, and Soundgarden. It, and it just, it just went nowhere at that point. Um, so, yeah, there was some label interest, but we never could get over the hump with signing the contract. That That's an old story for a lot of bands. And, you know, if you did get signed to that label or any, any other major label at the time, and the scene did start to change, like you said, with Nirvana and the rest of the groups at that, at that time, you know, a lot of bands, oh, well, actually a lot of bands, but a lot of labels put pressure on the bands. It kind of sounded like what was happening at the moment. Do you think if you had gotten signed, because it would have been really the very beginning of the band's career still, uh, would you have changed your sound and style to accommodate what was happening at the time? Maybe not go full grunge, but I mean, just, you know, write more in that vein to, to appease the label, or would you have, would you have backed out and said, no, this isn't what, who we are and what we write? I, as a, yeah. I, I think, I mean... I would say, I mean, if, you know, I might be able to talk to Ken. I may talk Ken into, you know, doing some drop D tuning, but that's about it. That's about as close as we get, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if there would have been a lot of, um, I mean, if you listen to the finale album, you'll hear sort of the evolution of the band as the 90s kept going, right? So things got a little different than what you hear in Standing in the Rain. Um but I, I don't think that there would have been a, a major sling there for us. That just wasn't who we were. Yeah, yeah no, I can see it that. Wasn't, yeah, it wasn't in the cards for us. Absolutely not. That's not who we are. Well, as the 90s go on, I mean, you know, 91, 92, things really haven't hit hard yet. I mean, you know, Metallica really exploded. I mean, they were getting big in the 80s anyway, but by the time 92 came out, you know, and the Black Album hit, that's when that whole thing just took off and everything. There was still hope for heavy metal at that time. It was slim, but there was (laughs) still hope. I mean, was not getting signed and the scene changing, we kind of said, you know what, let's just call it an end to the band? 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's really that's really what happened. Um, you know, it was definitely changing. We were seeing a lot of the places we were playing. Obviously, you know, that was changing. We were seeing the clubs going smaller for us. You know, um, mm-hmm. we were playing, you know, a, a clubs. We were doing national openers, and all of a sudden, we were starting to play, you know, smaller clubs and things like that. And it was, it, I think, the writing was just on the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I don't see us. Um, I, I again, I, I don't see us uh, trying to to be somebody we're not. I mean, it's just it's, it's you know, there have been bands have done it. I mean successfully like motley crew or somebody like that but i mean but, but you know but i sometimes i feel like it's a little fake it's a little um it, it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel real and then you sometimes you can you can you can tell and and uh, that that's just not who we are We're, we weren't going to bend it you know when it came to that was your heart just not in it anymore at that point in time? I mean, like, how does it end? Did, did, did the five of you get to the room and say, this isn't working, everybody walks away happy, or is there, or is there an argument about it, or is there one guy saying, no, no, let's keep trying to make this happen? <laughs> I mean, how, how does it how does it end, you know, for a band? Especially when you put five, six yeah. years into it. You know, I mean, there's always going to be frustration. I mean, there's, there's you know, every band has, I, I believe there's, there's going to be, you know, problems that uh, – every member has to work out and but we've always been great with talking to one another and being able to you know uh you know uh, talk about our our you know our, our our feelings whatever was going on you know hey you didn't play that song right hey this didn't happen you know and we talk about it and we and then we move forward but um like we said as the 90s progressed i mean it was just like we we just i i might have been one of the first to leave and and uh i just um I wanted to go into a, a different, a different. Yeah, I, I actually, I mean, just I, maybe I'm. I tried to dip my toe in the, in the grunge thing, and it just didn't work out. Ah, you see, I knew somebody did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, but, um, but no, I mean, ultimately, um, yeah, it, for me, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was the first to leave and and uh, pursued other projects, and uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I mean, just you know where your heart is and our heart is in melodic metal and then to, and, and, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing is that you can always go home and, 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 and it was great to be able to come home and reunite with these guys and, and just these guys are my brothers and I love them. And, uh, and, uh, it's great to celebrate metal as, as it, as it should have been and always will be hopefully. Very true, and I always thought you guys were one of the best hard rock bands to come out of the area at the time. You know, so many great songs. I'm happy that people are finally getting to hear them all. I, I mean, is there any hope or chance now that maybe you're all back to? I mean, you know, putting it back together again, even maybe a few new guys if you had to. Yeah, you know, there uh, obviously for the for right opportunities, absolutely. Um, we're a little spread out now. Um, we're not all located in central Pennsylvania. We've got a, we got some in Florida. I'm in South Carolina. But yeah, um, you know, we we've actually talked about it, about going and doing some reunion shows now that the, the second record's out, and uh, and we'll see how that pans out. Um, but yeah, there's a yeah. chance on that. Yeah, I and I actually uh, brought it before in uh, other interviews about maybe having Hell Records maybe doing a showcase with other label or with other artists on their label. Um, to you know, to you know, actually promote the label itself and the bands and they, like I, I keep calling it a celebration because that's what it is. We're celebrating you know the music we grew up with in the '80s and how we embrace it and honor it and it's our legacy and and so why not you know uh, bring it to the to the masses to the kids to you know show who we were and who we are and uh, you know um, I said about uh. Steve Whiteman of you know Kicks is uh, he had a side project called Funny Money and they're on the label. I mean, I'd, you know, I know Kicks is getting ready to hang it up. I don't know if Steve is still interested in, in uh, you know pursuing Funny Money, but I would just love to be able to uh, to do a showcase. I think that'd be awesome if we could uh, do it. Uh, yeah, if the opportunity comes, we would absolutely jump at it. That would be phenomenal if that yeah. could happen. I, I think Steve is done. He looks tired. <laughs> I think he's yeah, at it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Th- I think he's he's taking a break. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's amazing when you see some of these bands that have gone on for forty or fifty years, trudging along with every change that comes through the you know the music business and the music world, and just they just keep going and going and going. After a while, like anything else, it has to weigh you down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's 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 a tough life, and and those guys, you know, they hit it hard. So 
yeah, it's a, it, it was a good run. You know, I saw some footage from the uh, – I didn't get to go to the last show for them, but I, I got to see some of the footage. It was a great show, and, yep, they, they, they definitely deserve uh, a break. True. You, you think the biggest grind about being a musician is the business part of being in the music business, not the music? I mean, actually, now for musicians, I think this is probably the one of the most opportune times to go out there and, and put out your music because – I feel like a lot of artists are in control of their own destiny, if you will, by putting out, you know, YouTube with social media. I mean, just, I mean, anybody can write a song. And, and uh, I guess if you have the right followers, I guess, or, you know, if you have the right, you know, interest, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you can put it out yourself. But, um, but I mean, really, it really helps when you have a label like Heaven and Hell Records that's able to believe in you and then push our you know, push our product to the masses because we, could, we couldn't do this on our own. I mean, we were very extremely thankful for Heaven Hell Records for helping us with that. Yeah, and they do an amazing yeah. job. And I, I think we got Mike on the line right now. Mike, you there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> hey, right. there you are. Ken and Rod are here already. We've been chit-chatting. They've been talking a lot of trash about you. It's a good thing you called in late. <laughs> hey, 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 Michael, yeah. Rod's been making lead singer jokes and stuff. Oh, my, just, all I kept talking I, about I, was I, the guy I, stole I, the name I, of the band and used the name of the band for his last name, and they kept going on and on about that. Yeah, I initially wanted to call the band Taken, yeah. <laughs> I believe it, I believe it. Uh, well, Mike, it's good to have you on here. And we were talking about, you know, the new record and, and the last record, and we were talking with the guys about everything else. But, you know, we'll get to you. I mean, how did the band form? How did this whole thing come together for you? Um, I I had just got back from California. and Well, not just back. I, can, I got hit in the throat with a baseball while with a band in California and had to stop singing and didn't even know if I was going to be able to sing again. So I came back home with my tail between my legs. And uh, when I finally started getting my voice back, I thought, you know what, maybe I'll try this, but maybe I'll just start writing some stuff. And uh, through a mutual friend, we actually um, got together with Kenny and uh, I went and saw him playing and thought, wow, yeah, he's really good. And I called him and said, hey, would you like to start writing some material together? And he said, of course, yes. And that's when we came up with All I Want. And that's when it all started. When, when the five of you do get together now, I mean, is there a common goal of where the band should be and what it should sound like? Well, not, not really. We were just writing. And the more stuff we wrote, the better the stuff sounded. And more people were saying, hey. You know, <laughs> this stuff is really good. You guys got to get out there and play. So then we started thinking, well, let's let's put some stuff down on tape and see how it goes. So we got some musicians together. We got Rod and we got Jeff, mm -hmm. our bass player. And we went from there. And when the stuff came out of the studio, it was just awesome. <laughs> and that's when Kenny and I said, you know what? This this stuff is so good. Let's let's take it out and see what happens on the road. So we did. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's just um, you know, I mean, just uh, you know, I, I played with Kenny in a side project before this. Uh, we were in a little recording project called Ragdoll, and um, and you know, and we just you know we did some demos, and then uh, you know, and then went our separate ways, and then get a call back from Ken saying, you know, hey, this thing's getting ready to happen. You know, would you want to be a part of it? And I, you know, and I said, yeah, well, let's just let's see if the you know the personalities show, and they did. I mean, just like gangbusters. I mean, we we became like brothers instantly. And every everything went very well, and uh, and thus uh, Crisella was uh, created. Yeah. So so Mike, just just a, a a side story on on Jesse the bass player. So Jesse was a guitar student of mine. So I used to teach and. And uh, he came over one one night, and I'm like, hey, I, you know, I met this guy, Michael Cristello, and we're doing this stuff. We're looking for a bass player. And he's like, oh, I don't know any. And I'm like, dude, you're missing yeah. the point here. The point <laughs> is, I want you to be the bass player. And, and he's like, oh, okay, okay, I got it now. Yeah, it was funny. So he, that's how he ended up. He was actually a student, um, and, uh, and we were really good friends. And... Um, so he actually is a guitar player. He switched over to playing bass, and that's that's how he came into the band. That's great. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first show? Oh yeah, 
<laughs> I do. <laughs> I remember the that? song that played right before we came out. That would have been Ecolifties. It was a Pennsylvania Musician uh, magazine party. Uh, it was us, B.C. Roberts, uh, Easy Mickey, and um, and the song uh, that they played was um, by uh, the Jeff Healy band, Can You See the Light? Right before we went on, right before uh, the... Uh, we have an intro, uh, the uh, Olympic fanfare that we come out to. And, uh, I mean, I remember like it was yesterday, everything. I remember every little part about it, and it was amazing. I wouldn't change it for the world. It was a, it was a great show. We were saying before yeah, about so, maybe getting so the, back together. Is that a possibility to you? Yeah. Uh, Mike? That, that's a difficult question to answer because – we don't know what the interest would be, to be honest with you, right now. Do you guys have any feelings on that? Well, yeah, we, we talked yeah. about it, about possibly if the interest was there. I mean, we absolutely would consider – I mean, we would come together as a group and talk about it. I mean, you know, but I said uh, – I made mention about possibly, like, if Heaven Hell Records were to uh, – uh, do a showcase, you know, I mean, if we, you know, a showcase where we could just do one set, you know, do all the, all the, the hits, you know, using air quotations. Um, and, uh, you know, something like that would be, I'd, I'd be completely fine with that. I think it'd be great. Yeah. 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 I would too. And I would be, I'd jump at it in a moment, but it, it, I don't know with the way, the way the music scene is, I, I don't know. I don't know what would happen. It's rough, I know that, but you guys were on TV not long ago, so I mean, how bad can it be? The interest is there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna do a, hey, we're we, gonna we, do another podcast here in a couple of couple of weeks, so may, maybe maybe that'll stretch it out there, and somebody will say, yeah, okay, let's see. True. I mean, you know, most bands go to festival route these days. They try to get on a festival, play in front of a, a big group of people in one shot, and they take it from there because, you know, it does garner a lot of interest. But the club scene is hard today. There's not as many clubs as there used to be. That camaraderie that used to be there when you went, went out each week to go see bands play live, that's kind of missing these days. So it is a lot harder. I, I get that. You know, but as a fan of the band, I would love to be able to see you guys performing live and even writing new music. I mean, is there any music left over at all now or has everything kind of been put out there? Oh no! No, no, right? no, we don't have anything. No, the, the the well is empty as far as old stuff, and uh, I mean, even if we wrote new stuff, it it probably wouldn't have that Cristello sound to it that that everybody knows and loves. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we, I think Kick we, we, started. We, I think I believe Kick. I believe Kick started out when they came back out. That's what they did. They did some fairs and some you know music shows, and and that's where they took off for them. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What you yeah. just said is very true because a lot of people are like, well, you know, I hope this band gets back together. And then, you know, they write an album like Standing in the Rain again or music from that, that time. But you're right. It would probably be impossible to write something you wrote 30 or 40 years ago today with all the influences and other stuff that's coming in out of your life musically. Yeah. What, what do you think the band would sound like today, music-wise, if you did get back together and write new music? Well, uh, Man, I, I, I think I it could sound. I think it could... the drums would sound the same, guitars would sound yeah. the same, uh, vocals would be a little lower. <laughs> yeah. I still have that high range that I used to have, and uh, and then keyboards and and bass would be a whole different story. You know, everybody has their own little style and uh, where they go with with their instruments. So I don't know. It would probably sound pretty close, but like I said, it. Vocally, it would it would be different than the rest. I mean, Kenny can play guitar to anything, and uh, but <laughs> vocals, you know, you just got. You, I just don't have them anymore. I'm 67 years old, and <laughs> I just don't have those chops anymore. But you, uh, you don't look no, a day over you, 29. You still, you still got it. You still got it. You, yeah, <laughs> Michael. Michael, we tune down. We'll, we'll tune down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll tune down. We'll tune down for it. Yeah. So okay. yeah. Oh, tune, guys, you, tune down and, and quiet down is two different things. <laughs> very true. Well, you guys, you know, when Standing in the Rain yeah. came out, uh, you know, about six years ago, that really wasn't how you – is that how you really wanted the album to come out if you thought, it, you know, back in the 80s? Because it had a whole different name. The artwork was incredible. I love the artwork on that record. Is that what you would have hoped it would have been, in, you know, back in the 80s? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. 
Yeah, Heaven and Hell really hit the mark when they when they when they everything just came together like gangbusters. I mean, we could be more proud of the album. Um, but if that album when it came out, you know, at that time with the package we have currently, I believe we would we would have been on a major label. There's no doubt. I think so too. I mean, yeah. a few years earlier, it would have hit without it. You know, you would just, everything that was going on at that time. You guys were a part of, in my opinion. You know, you had the same sound and style. It was just a matter. You know, you could be the greatest musician in the world, the, the 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 greatest player in the world, but I think it's more luck than anything else in this business. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's if you, if you read it, if you read our reviews, a lot of reviews say that they just were a little bit late for their time. You know, yep. grunge came we in were... and, and just took everybody by storm. Yeah, we were we were late. We were a little late to the game. Well, but when the van came out, you really weren't late. You were just part of the scene that was happening around us. It just looks that way, you know, in hindsight, all these years later or decades later. You know, nobody knew what was going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next month. So, I mean, you know, you guys were doing what you were doing at the time you got together. There were bands that formed after you that fell apart even quick that were, just, that were amazing. And I'm like, you know, it's just being the right place at the right time. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Right, yep. right. No, well, record, record companies was looking at, at grunge and thinking, you know what, this we, we're going to hold off on this this old stuff here and see where it goes, and that's what happened, you know. It, it's crazy yeah. how one thing killed. Exactly. I, I remember uh, it was a VH1 show where they reviewed that where they talked about bands and interviewed bands and albums, and, and Brett Michaels was walking in there. No, it wasn't Brett Michaels. It was uh, Janie Lane. He was like, you know, he went to the record label that day, and there was like a ten by ten foot poster on the wall of Cherry Pie. You know, the girl, the girl holding the pie and everything. We were like the stars of the show. I went back a week later. We were torn down, and a picture of Pearl Jam was up, and we were, we were over with. And it was just that quick. And I never forget that story. Remember- it tells it like that. Yeah, I remember that interview. Yep. I, I remember that. That was the exact quote. That's exactly what happened. And yeah. Yeah, it's Jane Lane saw the writing on the wall. Yep, yep, I remember that. Yeah. Did, and that's very yep. true. That happened with, with every every band. I mean, and anybody who, you know, um, I mean, right down to guys cutting their hair and putting on flannel. It was just that, it, it, you know, our, our, our metal days were numbers. Yeah, but listen, even you talk about 85, you know, Motley Crue was getting big. You know, the whole hair metal scene starting to explode. Bon Jovi was big. Look at Ozzy. Ozzy put on sequins, the yellow sequins with the, with the long robe. You know, Judas Priest went, Judas Priest started going in that direction. Rob was teasing whatever hair he had left on him. I mean, everybody kind of, you know, everybody, you know, had, and I always got mad when bands did that. And then somebody said to me, you know, this is a business to them. This is how they earn their living. You know, they're not like the local band trying to play the club for $50. This is, they've got people to support support and there's that organization they have to do what they have to do to stay relevant i kind of understood it after that even though as a fan it bothered me but i did kind of get it when they said it that way yeah yeah i it's, mean I, you know but that's what that's what was moving units at the time that was that was what was selling and they just you know like guys uh, you know you know we we couldn't like we like ken said we started playing smaller clubs and venues and and uh you know the the you know, uh, the party was ending for us, but, um, but we, we've always had hope. I mean, we, there was always, uh, you know, hope that, you know, someday, you know, metal will have a resurgence. I think, uh, it was an interview with Lita Ford. She was on a beach, beach wrapped in this, uh, this, um, this blanket just saying like, I can't wait for the return of metal. And, and I, I know everybody thought the same thing. Everybody was waiting. Everybody was thinking what Lita was thinking, you know, waiting for metal to, for its glorious return. And, I, 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 you know, for lack, I, I think it is. I think it is here. I mean, I don't know if you guys feel different about it, but I, it's it's here and celebrated. It's back, and I think this is about as big as it's going to get. And I think it's going to probably stay at this level till I guess all of us just kind of die off in the future. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like you know, it's like when the when the doo wop in the fifties came and went, and then like twenty years later it was revived, and you know, and the disco in the seventies kind of disappeared in the eighties, and like ten years ago that was revived. It goes, it's generational. But what I noticed with with hard rock and heavy metal is that where I probably wouldn't have listened to my father's music growing up, you know. Kids today are listening to their parents' music. They're listening to Crystal and other bands like that. They're into the music that, you know, you guys put out and other bands from the 80s. So I think that's the biggest difference is that the newer generation is into this stuff because they realize just how good it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. I, I, think what, I, I, I think what's interesting is is how it is in, in, the other con- in other countries because this never really went away. It just sort of went down in the u.s obviously it, it had a crash but um 
But when you look in Europe and you look in you know Japan and things like that, um, the that that kind of hard rock and metal is still very popular. You know, so it's interesting how it is from a, a world standpoint too. You know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you go to the 80s, bands from all over Europe, uh, they'd want to come to America, break big here, make it here. This was the place to be. Now it's just the opposite. All the bands from America are trying to break big in Europe because that's where, where the scene is for all the bands today. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and Heaven to Hell Records has given us that opportunity, so we're extremely grateful yeah. for us, Jeremy. And, yeah. And I'm glad that he got in touch with you guys to put these records out. Guys, I'm going to let you go in a few minutes because I want to play some more music. I have another guest coming up behind you. Uh, but what a great yeah, job. Yeah. And for people that haven't bought Finale yet, I think they better go and get it pretty quick because from what I hear, is it's almost gone already. Oh, yeah. Rod said, Rod, said, Rod, said he, Rod said he would sell his stash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Put him on the black yeah. market. Hey, <laughs> yes. Hey, Mike. Hey, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, man, thank you for having us on again. It's an awesome show. It's great. We appreciate the time. And also, man, congrats on the 15 years of the Mayhem Madness um, show. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's kept me out of my wife's hair every Sunday for 15 years, so it's a happy marriage. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. Thank you, That's what I'm looking yeah. for. Guys, take care. The best of luck. And please, think about getting back together or at least putting out new music. I would love to hear more. Yeah, you'll All be right. one right. best. Appreciate it. You got it, guys. Take care. Thank Have a great you, night, everybody. Right. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. Take Bye. care, man. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, let's get on some more music off the finale record. Heaven and Hell, like always, does an amazing job at everything they put out. And this, this album Ooh. is... No different. Okay, we just hung up on everybody. Okay. All right, let me see. Uh, all right, we got enough time to get maybe two songs on. Let me see what we can do here for everybody. How about we do Time Rider Outside? This is a killer. Here we go. <laughs>
future tense off the Condemned to the Gallows record from 1984. It's hard to believe that band's been around since the late 70s. I've tried to reach out to almost every member of this band that I could find, and I've had no luck. I really would have loved to have Cog Van Drunen on the show, but uh, it just didn't work out that way. But Renia, uh, the guitar player, he's in a few other bands, and I, I think I am friends with him on Facebook. Maybe I should try to get a hold of him and see if I can get him on the show. All right, how about we play some Wrath? I'm going to get Randy on the line next. Uh, he's got a lot of talking to do because we got a lot of info we want to find out about Wrath. So, uh... We'll play something off that demo tape from 1984 called Racing with the Night, and I'll get Randy on the line. Let's get Randy on the line. Hello. Randy, this is Mike. Uh, you're on air live. Hey, Mike. How's it going? I'm doing great, man. It's a pleasure to talk with you tonight. Yeah, it's good to talk to you, too. 
Uh, I have to tell you, such a big fan of the band, a band that nobody can remember anything about, but we're going to get to the bottom of that tonight. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yeah. We'll clear up the mystery behind it. That's right. Well, you know, being a big tape trader back in the early 80s, you know, tape trading with my friends all over the world, I get a copy of the Wrath demo from like 1984 and become such a big fan. Then some years back, I think your guitar player kind of like remastered a lot of these songs and put them out there again on iTunes and other places like that. And people are starting to hear it again and they're realizing just how great this was. But nobody knows anything about the band. There's been so little out there over the years. So, I mean, let's kind of maybe take it back to the beginning, how it all got started. Yeah, uh, I basically was living in Trenton, Ontario, and then I moved up to Oshawa to, to get a band going. Quit my job, decided to uh, give it one last shot, and then uh, I guess there wasn't really anything to uh, to get together with groups in the in the past like there is today. So we most people just advertise in the paper. So like there was an ad, uh, an ad in the Toronto Star that I answered. And it just happened to be the guys in Wrath. They're looking for a singer. So I went down and auditioned, and uh, there was the four guys there already. Uh, Randall, uh, Jay, Duncan, and Freeman. And uh, they had a couple of guys lined up for that audition that night. So I showed up a little bit early and had a – I think I had a coffee with uh, Duncan beforehand. And he wasn't – you know, he wasn't giving me any uh, sign that, it, you know, I was getting any favors, right? So yeah. <laughs> I went in. <laughs> And uh, yeah, there was a guy. I think there was a guy ahead of me that rehearsed or with them as well. He tried out, and then uh, I went in second. And then I hear there's a bunch of kids outside the outside the door of the rehearsal room. And as I'm finishing up songs, we're rehearsing uh, like Rock Bottom by UFO and a couple of other songs like that. And uh, I heard the cheering outside, so I thought, well, maybe I'm in for this band. So. <laughs> It wasn't long after that I got the got the job, and then uh, we rehearsed pretty steady after that. That that's great. Well, I mean, the four guys were already together. Was there a singer in the band before you joined, or were they just you know together forming the band and looking for a singer? I think they were just together looking for a singer at the time. So there was no songs written, I guess, at that point in time. No. Well, it's 1984. The scene is just really starting to take off. You know, the underground heavy metal scene. You know, Metallica has their second record out. Bands like Slave are getting big. You guys come around. I mean, is there a sound that you're looking to create? I mean, because Wrath was a little different than everything else going on out there, I felt, at the time. But yet it was very familiar. Yeah, well, they actually had the four songs written before I got there, and three of them were lyrics already. So I wrote uh, the lyrics to Race with the Night. And that was kind of my... uh, my first, uh, I'll try it with the band writing lyrics. So, Randall had written, I think, the, the three songs previous to that Animation, Destiny, and uh, Fiscal Nights. So, I, I just added the lyrics to uh, Racing with the Night, and that was uh, my uh, input on that. But, like I said, they already had the, those songs together at that point. So, and so, those uh, songs wound up being on the first demo tape, all four of them. Yeah. And that was about all we had, so we uh, we uh, went in and did a demo tape, trying to get some interest from uh, record labels. Did you try shopping it around at the time, or was it just you know we did the four songs and we just couldn't make nothing happen? Well, we did send it out, and I think uh, Randall got some some feedback back from uh, RCA, but I think the band had already split by that point because uh, we lost uh, Jay. He he. Uh, had some family problems, so he had to leave the house, and then uh, he was living with a bass player in, in Oshawa, and uh, he left the band, and we had a replacement. And then we did a gig in uh, Oshawa. It was a battle of the bands that uh, I think uh, Anvil's uh, sound man or sound crew was doing uh, the sound for the thing. It was an outdoor gig that they had every year, and we uh, got on stage. We got two songs into our set. We did a Scorpion's... Uh, song and we did animation and about halfway through animation there was a fight broke out in front of the stage there was probably a thousand people there and uh, they stopped us from playing and the, the organizer got up on stage and said uh, if you don't stop fighting we're going to have to call this thing off right so the, this got bigger and bigger so they called in the police and shut the whole thing down I think that was kind of the beginning of the end of the band at that point this, uh, one of those uh, letdowns that uh, <laughs> that happened <laughs> 
the good old days of heavy metal. <laughs> it's always something. <laughs> were, were there a lot of shows yeah. played before that show, or was that the first one? Uh, we did uh, a couple of Battle of the Bands in Toronto at uh, Round and End, and we did one at Cheeks, because I think it was one of the guys from Amber on that, that, that bar. And uh, we, got a, we gave out, actually, the demo tape to, uh, I think it was Dave. Is that the other guitar player from the first album? I can't remember what his first name was, but he asked for a demo, so they're looking for a, an opening act for their, their shows. It never came about. And I think that was probably another uh, nail in the coffin, too. With, I think I'm a mentor, actually, ended up doing that. This was another Oshawa band. Yeah. Was it tough in Canada back then to get a band going? Canada's a big place, but everybody kind of lives in a small part of it. But still, I mean, you know, were there enough people, like, interested in, like, you know, starting music that had the same interests as each other back then? Or was it just a difficult place to, like, get a band going? No, actually, there was a lot of bands going in, like, the GCA, especially around the Durham region. There was a lot of uh, bands, like, Blind Vengeance, they got a record contract, uh, uh, Crimson Tiger, uh, Minotaur. Uh, there was like a whole scene there going on in Oshawa and Whitby area. Uh, Blind Vengeance and Minotaur kind of formed and became Harem Scarum after uh, yeah. a while. And then there was uh, Sphinx, which uh, the guitar player from that, and the drummer became Killer Doris with uh, Ross Hamas who was from Toronto. And they, uh, like I say, formed Killer Doors. And uh, like there was, a, there was a good scene going on. There was a good bar scene. There was a, a lot of bars to play at that time. Yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a compilation album that came out with Mystic Knights on it. And it brought a lot of attention yeah. back to the band again. I mean, when I, when I asked you about coming on the show, you're like, you sure you have the right wrath? I was like, yeah, I got the right wrath. <laughs> I mean, do you think people forgot about that? I know, like you say to yourself, we recorded one demo, we did a couple of shows, and that was it. But those four songs, that one demo, left a big impact on the underground metal scene. I don't know if you realize that or not. Well, yeah. I, in hindsight, I listened to it, and I go, yeah, it was pretty good. Like, I, you know, I didn't give it as much credit back then as I do now. But... Uh, yeah, there was definitely uh, something there. Just that, you know, when we're kids, we just expect things to happen faster than they do, right? So, yeah. no, it's <laughs> always like that. Was 15 at the time. <laughs> yeah. Wow, he was young. Yeah, you know, all the guys were in high school and stuff, right? Do yeah. you think if the no, band had uh, started yeah. later, when you guys were older, you might have had a better shot? You know, being a little bit more mature. Well, I was I was the old guy in the band at that time. I was like 24, so you know. The other guys were still in high school, and I think Duncan was working, and Franklin was maybe just out of high school. But we, uh, you know, I would say this: maybe we're, we're all the same age on the on the same page. We might have had a better shot at it. But you know, kids, yeah, I get kids, kids get ideas, and they want to move on, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Were those the only four songs that you guys ever recorded or wrote? Or was there other stuff that just wasn't released at the time, or ever got released? Well, we did. Yeah, well, when we tried to form as a, a four-piece band, and then uh, Randall had another song we wrote, but never got recorded. I didn't even remember the song, actually, when Randall mentioned it, but I forget what, how it kind of went. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that. Well, I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, Wrath wasn't your first band. You were probably singing before that. Do you remember the first band you were in where you thought you were going to take over the world? <laughs> well, the first band I was in was just with some buddies of mine that we... We were all on the kiss at the time, and we decided to get a band going, but only two of us actually did it. So the guitar player and I had a band, and we got some other kids from around the area to start. So we uh, were going to go on the road and do a Black Sabbath tribute, basically, and that's why we got management. We were going to go on the road with uh, an agent that we had in Toronto. That's how I met uh, Russ from Oz, who became a singer from Killer Dwarfs. I met him... Uh, because he had the same manager as we had at the time. So I followed him down east because I filled in for a band that needed a singer for a tour that they had booked down uh, in Newfoundland, New Brunswick. So I went down with them for five weeks and, and sang uh, pretty much every night for five weeks straight. And then uh, that kind of uh, told me that I needed to work on my vocals better. So I got some lessons from an opera singer in Toronto and worked on my, uh, my endurance, basically. And I kind of developed that, and that band kind of split up that I was in at that time, and then I ended up going to Oshawa and 
joining Wrath. So, so Wrath came right after that. I mean, how long did Wrath last? I mean, in, in theory, I mean, was it what is it a year, a, a year or two, if even that? Uh, I moved up to Oshawa in the week three, like pretty much uh, Christmas break, basically, and then I started looking for bands shortly after that. So I joined them in probably the spring of '84. And that demo tape probably came early summer. And we did some stuff uh, up until, I think I think our last gig was probably uh, July. So it wasn't very, sh- it was pretty short-lived. Everything happened really fast back in those days. No, that it did, but I didn't think it was that fast. I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was real quick. <laughs> it was very fast, yeah. It was like six months or seven months. <laughs> wow. Were you, are you, did, yeah. did, I mean, did you think people forgot about the band as the years went on? Or did you see, you know, it was a little blip on the radar for me, but for a lot of other people, like I said, they really loved the music. Well, there was a bit of a resurgence uh, about 15 years ago. I, I got a Facebook message from somebody in Oshawa, the area there, that wanted to get me reunited with uh, Randall and uh, talking about a rap reunion or whatever, but Jason he moved to England, so he's a he's a stonemason artist in uh, Salisbury, England now. So he'd be out of the picture for sure. But Randall and I actually did a project uh, called Bannister White, but uh, I guess it was 14 years ago, and we did a, a CD. Uh, we had all the tunes written. I just had to sing it, basically. We did uh, Rhythm of the Night again on that as well. But that was, like, like I say, 14 years ago. We did a few gigs, and then nothing ever became of it, so. It was the last we, uh, we had contact with, band-wise, anyway. Yeah. Do you, did you, do you think now about maybe trying to do it again? Because there are so many European festivals that would love to have a band like Wrath on the Bill, but you need more than four songs, probably. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, the people that did the uh, the album that put Mr. Knights on there, they said if they had a they had, had a full-length album, they would have put it out, too, because they, they liked the stuff we did. But, uh, yeah, we'd have to record some new stuff, obviously, if we're going to do something like that. Yeah. Do you talk with Randall still? Do you think maybe you might, you know, think about trying to put something back together or is or the Days of Wrath just completely behind you now? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, actually. Like Randall's talked about bringing in before, but he's got, he's pretty busy. He's got two bands or two, three bands on the go at, at the same time. So he's, he's a busy guy. He, he makes a living as a musician. So he, uh, you know, he's pretty well the brains behind the operation. He's, <laughs> he's got a jazz man. He's got a rock band. He's got you know, he's top music his whole whole career basically. So yeah, if you can make a career out of music, you're you're one of their lucky ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's never really had a real job. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys gave us great music. Years on the railway. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. If the rat was over, did you just give up on music completely as far as singing goes? No, I've been singing with bands uh, uh, pretty much. Well, I had a little break there, but maybe maybe 10 years or so when I got married. I got into coaching hockey and stuff and uh, kind of gave up on the band thing for a while. But I think it was when I was, when I was about 40, I started playing in bands again. So right around there. Well, that was good. I know marriage is a dream killer. I mean, I tell it to my wife all the time. But, you know, sometimes things yeah, have to die, yeah, you know? Sure. Once you get married, you have a family, you have kids and other stuff, you know, everything kind of gets put on the back burner. But I would love to see a Wrath reunion, and I hope that you and Randy can talk about this and maybe make something happen. You never know. It might might happen. That would be fantastic. That's right. Never say never. (laughs) I'm sure that, I mean, I'm sure there's some songs somewhere out that need to be written by you guys because the ones that we have, you know, I play it to death, but I need to hear more. Yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do. All right. Well, Randy, I'm not going to keep it. We're going to wrap up the show in a little bit. I want to play some more songs off the demo tape. We only got four, so we'll get through most of them probably before the end of the night. But okay. I can't thank you enough for being on here. And, you know, everyone wanted to hear from Wrath and what was going on with you guys and what happened back in the day. I know it was very short-lived, so there's not a lot to talk about with it. But you guys did give us some great music at that short period of time. And you never know. Maybe one day we can't get more. You never know. <laughs> All right, my friend. You take care and have a great well, night. Me, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep, take care. All right, let's get on another song off the Wrath demo. These are the remastered versions that uh, Randall did. I, I want to say it was a few years back, if I remember. I'm not exactly sure of the date, but here's Mystical Nights.
This is Neil Turbin from Death Riders, and you're listening to Heavy Metal Mayhem Radio Show on Blog Talk Radio with Mike the Big Cheese. Don't forget to be fierce and stay thrashing and stay metal thrashing. It's hard for people to believe that Anthrax were once a really good band. <laughs> the Neil Turbin era of Anthrax, Fistful of Metal, everything after that I kind of disliked tremendously. There were a few good songs on the second record, but they're actually from the Neil Turbin era of the band, just redone with Joey Belladonna on vocals. Uh, when I interviewed Cole Kennedy, I think the first or second time, many years ago, probably 12 years ago, you have to go back into the archives to find that interview. Uh, we, you know, we talked a lot about his producing for Megaforce back then, and he produced, you know, Anvil, Excited, T.T. Crick, uh, The Anthrax, and a lot of those records. And he was telling a story about how he brought Matt Fallon in to replace Neil Turbin, and then the band had a problem with him, and then, you know, they wound up with Joey, and he didn't want to be a part of the band, and they didn't want him in there. I, it was a pretty good story. I got to go try to dig it up myself, and the next time I have a call on, we're going to go back and talk about that again, so... uh some good stuff over there, Cole. He has a lot of stories to tell. And I'm waiting for the new Rod record to come out, which should be in 2024. A lot of great records are going to happen next year. This year was an amazing year for heavy metal. A lot of the great underground bands put out killer albums, old school bands, new bands. It just keeps getting better and better every year. That's pretty impressive for the decade that we're in, I have to say. Ah, okay. No more interviews. We're done for tonight. Uh, you know, we interviewed Crystal early on. It's it's always hard when you have to interview two or three people at one time because I hear all three people in the headphones at the same time, and there's a delay. So, like, you, you're answering one person's question, you're trying to ask someone else something, and the other one is still coming through one set of headphones and going out the other. It's very dic- difficult to interview more than one person at a time. But we got through it and we made it happen. They were a great bunch of guys to talk to. Uh, who do we have on next week? Oh, Barry Perkis, the great Thunderstick, is on next uh, next Sunday night. So don't forget to tune into that. It's been many years since I've spoke to Barry, and we could easily chit chat for an over an hour if we want. So next Sunday night, Thunderstick is on the show. He's got a brand new record coming out. 
So don't forget to tune into that. All right, Christian gives me some great requests every week. He digs up some pretty classic underground stuff. He went into the hair metal route this week, a band called Zaw. Uh, they only had one release out. I think it was 1985 called Plays of the Game. The band came out in 82, lasted a few years. I think 86, 87 was kind of over with for them. If I remember, the band consisted of three brothers, uh, the Tahan brothers. They played everything with drums. They had Ludwig van Guy on drums. It was a pretty good band. You know, it was, uh, they were kind of early or late to the game, however you want to say it. Not a bit of record, but Christian, here you go. Too much. No, we're going to do much too late. I'm sorry. <laughs>
All right, Jimmy wanted to hear Havoc, The Grip. There you go, from 1987, I believe. All right, we're going to wrap it up here tonight. I want to thank Ken, Rod, and Mike from Cristolo, and I want to thank Randy from Wrath. Next week, Barry Perkis will be on the show. We'll be talking to Thunderstick next Sunday night. All right, let's close it up here tonight with a little bit of Heathen's Rage. Here's Fight Till the End. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday.